Good evening and welcome to the WDSU News Hot Seat. I'm Travers Mackle. Tonight we have a very special guest, outgoing New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu and what will be his final sit-down, in-depth interview. First off, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Let's just I never jump. I thought of myself as an outgoing man. I That's know, eight years ago. It <laughs> seems like it was yesterday we were doing your first incoming interview. You blink and it's over. 2,920 days. I know. How many days we've been in office. It is amazing. Every one of them has been spectacular and wonderful and lovely and happy. Right, and happy. <laughs> That's the key. Right. <laughs> Let's just start with this. Is New Orleans a better city after eight years of Mitch Landrieu? Dramatically. Dramatically better. Not just of me, but the, the one thing that the people of the city of New Orleans have done for the people of America is demonstrate to them that when you come together and to find common ground, you can completely rebuild a broken city, which is essentially what we have done. If you think about all of the new rec centers that were built, all of the new libraries, all of the new health clinics, the three new hospitals, the new airport, the new riverfront development, the new World Trade Center, the massive amounts of investments that we've made in roads, this city is not only better than it was, but better position than it has been in a, in a really long time. What, we're gonna get to your highlights and lowlights, what you wanted to get done and didn't get done, as well as some more highlights, but let me talk about your book. I read it, it was interesting. In the Shadow of Statues, A White Southerner Confronts History. You discussed in depth the removal of the four Confederate monuments last year. Many people say, right call, Mayor Landrieu needed to be done, but others say it only divided the city over a polarizing issue. What do you tell those people right now, the people that feel this wasn't the best thing to do for New Orleans? Well, first of all, the book was not just about the statues. The, we didn't, I didn't get to the statues until page 167. It was almost a political autobiography, if you will. Well, the book was about race right. in America, and particularly in the South. It was a need to explain where I came from, who I am, and why I did what I did for the historical record. And on the issue of race, as I have said, and I've been addressing this issue, literally, if you read the book, since I was born, and on the shoulders of my father and many other people that have walked through this. And unless we deal with the issue of race in America and we find a way to make sure that everybody is welcome. And of course, as writ large, this is true about people irrespective of race, creed, color, religion, sexual orientation, that the country's not gonna be able to go forward. The prism was the monuments. Now, I'm very proud of that decision, and I'm very proud of the people of New Orleans because, as you know, now people across the country are mirroring what it is that we're doing. Most of the people in New Orleans have always supported that. There have been a couple of people that have really big pocketbooks and big mouths that have made this a bigger deal than it should have been, and people outside of the city that really don't have any ownership of the city have opined about it, but the majority of the people of the city have always wanted to take them down. That's part A. Part B, I didn't create the issue of race. I didn't create the Civil War. All I did was call the question on symbols that were being revered in places where they should not have been. And those issues tend to divide people. We tried to do it in a respectful way. The democratic process we followed was robust. It was more democratic than any other place. But race is a tough issue. And you can expect that when you engage in an issue like that, there's going to be disagreement on both sides. A lot of people say, why not put it out to a vote of the people? It would have passed more than likely if you put it out to voters, overwhelmingly probably in Orleans Parish. So well, why not just let voters vote on first this? First of all, we don't have a mechanism for referendum in the state of Louisiana. Every issue, the state budget, which is by far the biggest thing that we do, doesn't go to a vote of the people. The elected representatives vote on it. We follow the process that was in the law. And so I guess the question you ask is, why should the Confederate generals have more of a right relating to that than, let's say, whether or not you're gonna fund NORD or build new libraries. It's a specious argument. Look, people are against taking the monuments down. They should say, I'm against them, and no matter what you do, no matter what process you use, and by the way, no matter what good you do in any other area, I'm just gonna hate you for it, because that's what I think. That's a much more honest recitation than coming up with these false arguments about why we didn't do it a, a certain way. The issue is really clear, I called the question. We had a monument in this city that was re revering Robert E. Lee, who never stepped foot here, because he fought a war to destroy the United States of America for the cause of the Confederacy, which was designed to protect slavery. That's not who the city of New Orleans is. That's not who we have ever been. And so as we've been getting, rebuilding the city and preparing ourselves for our future, it was really important to clear that space out and to use it for something that was unifying. I think. Historically, it would be remembered really, really well. It was clearly the right thing to do, and it would just be one of 
a whole bunch of other really good things that we've done over eight years. The people who disagree with me about that will never agree with me about anything that I do the rest of my life. And that's just kind of the way it's going to be. Let's get back to your book. By the way, on a lighter note, as a De La Salle grad, I like the fact that you said you wanted to go to De La Salle, but I, ended up at Jesuit. I, I, I we, did. We can that's go. a true story. It is a true story. We my can, mom, and that's the only time my mother ever lied to me. Well, we can go. We'll get to that in a later. Right. We'll, we'll talk about that later on. So in the book, you talked about the dysfunction that you inherited back in 2010 when you took over from the Nagan administration. Let's just call it what it was, a corrupt administration. The former mayor's in jail. His top lieutenant is true. a convicted felon. Yeah, you talked about money that was in the pipeline that, wasn't, that they weren't able to get. No real federal and state partnerships. How hard was that coming in in 2010 and dealing with what you were dealt, the hand you were dealt back in well, 2010. Well, let me, let, me, let me put that in context for you. What you said about Menegan is accurate, but it wasn't all his fault either. I mean, just to remember what, this city was an old and tired city, and it was a descending city before Katrina hit. In 1960, we had 680,000 people. The night before Katrina, we had about 460. So the city had been going in the wrong direction for a long time because a lot of decisions that a lot of people made the surge of waterboard was was damaged before Katrina. And hit. we're going to get to that. Then in a second, Katrina, yeah, right. then Katrina hits, and Katrina destroyed the whole city. It is true that Mayor Nagan's team did not do a good job, and the city. When I got here, the recovery was not really moving in any direction. Everybody in the city was fighting with each other. We had a hundred million dollar hole in the budget. The police department, that police department, was bankrupt. It was under indictment. The federal government was threatening to come in with a consent decree. I mean, you, you really could not have taken over a situation that was worse for a whole bunch of different reasons, not just because of Mayor Nagan, although he contributed to it. There's no question about that. And so I'm not aware of a more difficult job that any mayor or any city in America has had pulling themselves back up. And I say it that way because it was a communal effort. I mean, all I could not have done what I did for the last eight years that the people of this city weren't willing to make tremendous sacrifices, which we did because, as you know, we had to cut a $100 million hole in, out of you our budget. You had to furlough people immediately. Well, let me just say this. When you cut 22% out of your budget, you don't know any other government that's ever done that in the history. Of the, I, I don't know. The federal government certainly can't even Detroit, balance the budget. Detroit, maybe, they were so. Detroit. So that was hard because I had to furlough about 4,000 people, which meant that 4,000 people had to for, forego that paycheck for two weeks. We renegotiated contracts, we consolidated boards and commissions, we got rid of rules and regulations, we had to renegotiate the firefighters pension fund, which as you know was a 30-year legacy problem that right. now that we're fixed is going to save the city about 500 million dollars. So it was, it, it was hard. I mean, what we've, what we've done in the city is hard, which is why where we've gotten in the last eight years is really a miraculous testament to the will of the people of the city of New Orleans. You pride yourself, you just mentioned this with the Firefighters Pension Fund and some other long range projects, of being a mayor who, who doesn't kick the can down the road, that some of your predecessors have been accused of that, whether it's right or wrong. But back on August 5th, 2017, there was an issue that popped up with the Sewage and Water Board. You're well aware of it. Massive issues were exposed. Why did it take so long to overhaul that entity and do you believe right now, as you're leaving office, that anybody has confidence in the Sewage and Water Board? Well, two things. First of all, you can't fix everything. As I've said, we've fixed a lot of stuff, and it's a lot better than it ever has been. But you live in an old city. It's 300 years old. The oldest thing in the city is the Sewage and Water Board. And by the way, we didn't kick it down the road. We've been working on the Sewage and Water Board for eight years. But the Sewage and Water Board was in bad shape before Katrina. It was in much worse shape after Katrina. And we began to work on it immediately because, as you may recall, the thing that really bothered us the most was boil water advisories because of power generation and, and the upset of water. Everyone so, hates them, let's just be clear. No well, one likes to boil their water. Well, no, I mean, they're right. awful. I right. mean, nobody, who want, everybody hates right. boil water advisories. Right. But, but essentially, the Sewage and Water Board is a, is a good symbol of the city. It's an old, tired city that has not reinvested in its infrastructure in order to bring it into the 21st century. So what we, what we have to do at the Sewage and Water Board is continue to do the intense work that we've been doing for the last eight years. What happened on August 5th, to be clear, was a 100-year storm that nobody could see coming, not even the National Weather Service. It dropped five to nine inches of water on the city in a very short period of time in a very small part of the city. If that happens tomorrow, the city's gonna flood again. There's, you, you have a situation in this but city. But that's not reassuring for a lot of people well, I'm just, right now. Well, let me just say this. The city, from, well, from 1718 until today, 
every time that's happened, the city has gotten water in it. When I was, when I was 18 years old, in May of 1978, the day after Mayor Morial take, took office, Broadmoor had five feet of water in it because of the intense rainfall. So the, we, live in a, we live in a bowl. You live in a place where the coast is eroding. You live where there are more storms coming. Now, having said that, you can do a lot of things to mitigate your circumstances. You can build higher, but I'm telling everybody this. The Sewage and Water Board, has, we have invested a lot of money in it, but it is, a, it is the oldest system in America. It's too old, it's too obsolete, it's got a lifespan, it now needs to be recreated. And you have to find money to buy these massive engines. Now, if you haven't been to the Surge and Water Board plant, you should go see it because the people have a hard time understanding this because if you don't go see it, it's bigger than the Superdome and bigger than the uh, Unfortunately, airport. we've been out there a lot since August. Exactly, yeah. so you know now that this is a massive thing. So it would be like somebody saying, okay, we've got to crash the Superdome and build a new one and crash the airport and build a new one. It is a big thing that takes a long time. I'll say this haven't tried to get that organization moving in the right direction. It is an old, tired organization that's stuck in the past. It needs to be turned around and it needs to become ready for the future. That is a, it's gonna cost a massive amount of money. It's the next big thing that we have to really focus our attention on because you can't just keep repairing what's there. The machines are too old. The infrastructure's too tired and there's not enough money that's been put in it over the years. However and whenever the community decides to have trust in whatever they wanna trust in, those boards have been redone. We had two reform boards in place. Yes, there were leadership issues at the Surge and Water Board. Yes, there are human resources issues at the Surge Board. Yes, the finances are a little bit out of whack because there's not enough money in drainage. But essentially, if you don't find a robust amount of money to buy new sources of power and to recreate how we protect ourselves, we're gonna to continue to have trouble. Really quickly, because we do have a lot to get sure. to. Was it incompetence or corruption back then in August? Because you were lied to and you admitted well, it wasn't that your office- The Surge and Water Board is not it's not corrupt in the way that years ago people were stealing money. That's not true. We have an open procurement process. And the fact of the matter is the, the one mistake that was made that was unacceptable is that the leadership of the Sewage and Water Board did not come to me last March and say, look, we are really, the, 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 the wheels are falling off the car. Those people didn't create that system either. They, they, they were in it, but it's an old tired system. What they should have done in March of last year is rung the bell and said, we have an emergency we're going to be compromised during the season and we've, got to, and we've got to fix it. Now for the past eight months, I have spent most of my time and my team has at the Surge and Water Board. We now have more power sources than we've had really in the history of the city and the, and the power sources are stabilized, but it is a very old, it's a very tired system and if you don't replace it, it's going to continue to break. Let's talk quickly, crime in the city of New Orleans. About 160 murders last year. That was down one from 2016. The lowest total in your eight years was 2014, 150. The highest total, 199 in your first year back in 2011. How, quickly here, at about two minutes or so, how, how does New Orleans address the crime problem moving forward? Because it's something every mayor has tried to put yeah. his arm ar arms around and hasn't really been able to tackle. Well, actually, the crime rate from 1996 to today it's is down. dramatically, dramatically low. But there's still I mean, too many though. Well, there's, uh, let me say again, there's a whole bunch of stuff that still needs to be fixed. We're talking about trends. From 1996, I think we had 435 we had. murders that year. As you notice in my lowest year, we had 150. That is a dramatic reduction. Now, having said that, crime, crime is, is intractable in some neighborhoods in this city. And it's not just about the police department. It's about public safety, it's about public health. It deals with issues of opioids, it deals with issues of criminal justice system. We've tried to attack all of those things. So now we have a brand new youth study center that's not just a prison but has a school in it. We have now, as you know, completely restructured the way the jail works. We, the police department, when I came into office, was completely bankrupt. Although many of those police officers were wonderful, a lot of them left the city after Katrina and never came back. Some of those officers were under indictment and the Justice Department was coming in because they said we've got to turn it around. We have now successfully over the last eight years completely reconstructed the New Orleans Police Department and stopped the outflow and we now are hiring more people that are coming in although we still need more police officers. We have made a lot of progress on some of the crime sections. Armed robbery is down dramatically right now. But for example, the other night, we had one person, just one, that committed like seven crimes in about four hours. Shot six people, killed one. Well, right. yeah, but he, but, but he did this like on four separate occasions right. over a nine, 
When you have people like that that are wreaking havoc in the city, you can make everybody really feel bad. So again, early childhood education, you know, really good parenting, good recreation centers, good job opportunities. Of course, we've created 20,000 jobs. We've brought in new major companies like DXC Technology. All of these things will have an impact, but it really takes time. Having said that, I don't want to make this, sugarcoat this. We have a very serious problem with violence in this city, and the culture of violence has permeated this city for a long period of time. It's something that I spent a lot of time on. I wish that I could have made more progress. It is, it is intractable all over the country, and I'm gonna to continue to work on this issue in my you know, next iteration. Really quickly here, let me give you some names and give me one oh, sentence, no, maybe a word even. <laughs> Bobby Jindal. He was my governor. Ray Nagin. He was my mayor. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, John I'm not gonna get it. He's a good friend and he's been good to the city. Steve Scalise. He's a great guy. David, I agree with him all the time. David Vitter. He, he, we grew up together. You're going to leave it at that right there, yeah, I think. Well, Mary yeah. Landrew. My big sister. And our patron, a great leader for the city. Donald Trump. He, he, chaos. That leads me to the next question. Is there a chance you are going to run for president or seek higher office? A lot of people, you've made the rounds, national outlets, national shows. A lot of pundits are saying Mitch Landrew would be a good candidate for, ma for president. Excuse me. Are you running for president? I'm not running for president. Uh, I hear all that chatter. Will you run for president? Let me, let me answer the question. I hear all that chatter. It really is a testament to what we've done in the city, and it, and, it, and it does make you feel good that people think that you can play on that level. I don't intend to do that. The next question is always, well, will you rule it out? Will you never rule anything out? I don't really know what I'm going to do next. I've been doing this, as you know now, for 30 years, having served as a legislature for 16, lieutenant governor for six, and now the mayor for eight years. And this year, I was president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So, I've had a really long, robust, and fruitful career. I'm still young. I really haven't decided what I'm going to do. I actually want to get some distance from what I've been doing for the past 30 years to think about it. But you know, who the heck knows? I mean, we'll see. Let's speak about the woman who's going to take your place, Latoya Cantrell, City Councilwoman for District B. Is she ready to become mayor of New Orleans? Yeah, of course she is. Yeah, she served on the City Council. As you know, we've had a really long transition. We've been able to work together shoulder to shoulder in the past six months. Our team has given her team every piece of information that they need. I trust she'll hire a really good team and I expect her to do well and I really want the people of New Orleans to give her a, a chance and work with her. You have fought tooth and nail with the current Attorney General, Jeff Landry. He's no ally of yours. Is he right to investigate her credit card use right now as she's going into office? Uh, you know, first of all, that's- Or is it politics? Well, I, I don't know because I don't know anything about the facts and circumstances. It's not a good place for her or him to be. I will say that there are politicians that are not from New Orleans that always use New Orleans as a whipping boy. And he's certainly, you know, been a number one on that list. Anytime there's an investigation, the facts have to go where they go. I don't know what the facts and circumstances are. It's not a great thing for the city, and I hope that she's out of it very soon so that she has the freedom to govern like she should. You've touched on a lot of highlights, DXC technologies, the playgrounds, the firehouses, the airport. If you look back over the last eight years, is there one thing that you say, man, I just wish we would have gotten that done or done that better? What, in essence, is your biggest regret in about a minute here because we are running out of time? I don't, I, don't, I don't think about it like that, and I'm not sure I'm close enough to it. We made mistakes. You know, we made decisions that you think, well, why did you make that decision? Because you were under pressure. You shouldn't have tried to that program because it didn't work. Um, I, I regret that I wasn't able to do much, much more. I mean, I did more than, than I mean anybody could humanly do, but you still go, oh my goodness, I wish the airport were open today rather than you know, in six months. I wish the World Trade Center wouldn't have taken four years, it should have taken two. I wish we would have gotten the deal done with the Public Belt Railroad early so that you could do more, because when you're mayor, you have the voracious appetite to just continue to produce. I, I think we've left the city in really, really good shape. However, this is an old, beautiful, wonderful city that requires tender, loving care. And, and I'm hoping, my hope for the city, my, my dream for the city, is that we stay in the moment that we're in where finding common ground is an important principle and that diversity remains you know, our greatest strength. And I'm very optimistic and hopeful about the city and the people, and I've loved serving them, and I'm just really thankful to have had the opportunity to do so. Final question, your father was in politics, your sister was in politics. As you mentioned, you've spent a lifetime in politics. In a word, if that's possible, because this is the last question, how does history remember Mitch Landrieu? In a word. Hopefully well. But well, together, by the way, this will be on May 7th, it'll be the first time 
that a Landry hadn't been in elected office in 40 years, and collectively, between me, Mary, my father, and my sister Madeline, we served 100 years. All right. It's a well, long time. Congratulations. Some people, some people would be happy to see us go. <laughs> We'll, we'll say. Mayor Landry, thank, thank you very it's much. Great. It's great to see you. It is great to see you too. That is, for the, that is all for the hot seat. Mayor Landry's last day in office, obviously inauguration day, coming up in just a few days.